Welcome in. This is your odds checker betting preview for this week's Wyndham Championship. I'm Rick Gaiman. That right there, Jeff Feinberg. And Jeff, final event of the regular season. Last chance for glory or last chance to get yourself into the FedEx Cup playoffs. Yeah, I guess that in and of itself brings up an interesting conversation. Are the players on the bubble? Like, will desperation breed brilliance? Or from an outright win perspective, do you feel so much safer, say, backing a guy, you know, safely in the FedEx Cup in like 70th or 80th who can play this carefree and not have to keep an eye on, oh, I need like a T9 this week to keep my season alive. So the story within the story and a lot of big names on the outside. So something to follow. I tend to think that if these guys could flip a switch, they would have flipped it uh, four or five weeks ago and not waited until the very last moment. That's my opinion, Jeff. Yeah. No, that's probably a fair, a fair point. They're certainly not waiting on, you know, with all the variables that golf presents, no one is, no one has saved themselves for this event. No, I can't imagine. Although maybe if someone did, it's Webb Simpson. Let's pull up the odds checker grid here. Webb Simpson has been uh, phenomenal at the Wyndham Championship. He is the favorite to win this, essentially 12-1 to 1 across the board, but being nipped at the heels by one Hideki Matsuyama, who you can get at 15-1 to 1 on FanDuel. And Jeff, those are the only two golfers uh, shorter than 20-1. to 1. So I, I know you were saying you haven't completed your card or haven't gotten much of your card in play yet, but are, are we are we starting near the top? No, I'm going to skip these two uh, entirely. I don't offer anything for me. I'm afraid, you know, Webb Simpson winning this event would shock nobody. Webb Simpson winning by a touchdown probably might not shock anybody. I even joked with Mayo that Webb winning the Wyndham, would that even improve his Ryder Cup case? Like <laughs> he, people would just say, yeah, I guess I, we expected him to win it. Uh, to win it, I guess. But I, I'm not. I'm not here. If I get bitten by either of these guys, I'll just have to accept my fate. Yeah, I'm in a similar boat. It's listen. I I, I can't imagine it, the, the the scenario that you just described. No one would be surprised if he won. No one would be surprised if he wins by a touchdown. No one would be. No, it wouldn't even impact his Ryder Cup implications. Uh, that generally doesn't breed a number that I think is worth betting, which is twelve to one here for Webb Simpson. So I'll go further down as well. The twenties start with Louis Oosthuizen, who has been in the mix seemingly every week, and then we get a cast of characters that uh, I often don't know what to do with. That's your Patrick Reeds, your Will Zalatoris's, your Brian Harmons, and even your Jason Kokrax here as we start to get into the 30s. Yeah, uh, I would say off the bat, I think Louie does present value. That 20 to 1 available when using the grid did stuck at, stick out to me if I wanted to make that move. I've yet to bet Louie this year. I don't think I've bet Louie in a couple years. Uh, I've made other losing outright bets. Don't get me wrong. It's <laughs> not like I've you know, so it's not like I'm betting winners while Louie's finishing T10, what have you. I this may, might seem like a good place to start, but in the end, I think I'm going to look farther down the board. If I just like woke up out of a coma yesterday, I would probably hammer the Patrick Reed 22 to 1 at the Wyndham, despite it being a lower rung event. But this is like an insane amount of golf for Reed. So if he wins, I'd just be happy for him. I'm actually staring at that 28 to 1 on Will Zalatoris, Rick, is where I might just fire my first bullet uh, right now. Finally showing the life last week that I wanted uh, to see, and I believe this sort of course at the Wyndham sets up perfectly um, for Will Zalatoris. It would might even be his last event of the year for all sorts of reasons. We could do a separate podcast on. Yeah, he's not in the FedEx Cup. I do like Will Zalatoris. Also acknowledging value might be on Jason Kokrak, sort of like English, a very steady player all season long. Now we're in a a bad field, and his number does seem fair. 
The best number on Jason Kokrak is at FanDuel 31 to one. You know, Zalatoris answered a lot of questions for me. I, I was wondering how he was going to come back uh, out without the injury. And if you're talking about guys who have motivation, uh, motivation for Zalatoris is not a T9. It is not a T8. It's not a T13. It's not a six-way tie for third. It's win. Win and get yourself in the FedEx Cup playoffs. So he has eyes for one spot. It's the top spot. I've actually kind of started uh, assessing my card or at least starting my card in the 30s, which is probably the lowest I've gone in a long time, Jeff. Uh, but there, I think there's a case to be made about Sung Im bouncing back off of one of the worst putting performances of his life, back-to-back -back top tens at this event. And the one that I think I can't stop staring at is Russell Henley, 35 to one. We haven't seen him play since the Open Championship. He's been in contention uh, a handful of times in his last four starts. This is a place that I think turns into a bit of a wedge fest and, and few guys can hit their wedges and their approach shots like Russell Henley can. So those are the two that I would be targeting in the 30s, which, you know, might be crazy, but I don't I don't think I mind it that much. I might just have to concede to you, Rick, because um, last week, I'm lucky. I get to speak to you. I get to speak with Pat Mayo, and you both tried to talk me into Harris English. <laughs> I didn't listen. Um, granted, it didn't work out in the end. Uh, I didn't sleep well for three days because of, because of it. So he's very much likes Henley as well, and maybe I should just take advantage of being able to speak to smart guys like you and and take information like that to the bank. Sung Jay, there's going to be a huge, I mean, yeah, I, he loves the Wyndham. There's no secret about that. Uh, I like Sung Jay a lot this week as well, but okay, I'm going to have to like triple circle Russell Henley and uh, a lot. Hopefully we really double focus on that. Hopefully we get a different outcome from the Harris English outcome last week. Uh, that leads us into the forties and the fifties. Siwoo Kim coming off of uh, a devastating, not only rounds, but four rounds uh, last week. He's at 40 to one. He's won this event before. And then the fifties are kind of interesting. The fifties offer up a couple of uh, veterans, Adam Scott, Kevin Nog, Gary Woodland, and also a couple of young, uh, not only call them young guys because Seamus power is not necessarily young, but like trying to forge the pen here along with Robert McIntyre on the PGA Tour. Yeah, uh, this is where I think I have the majority of my decisions to be made this week, Rick. Gary Woodland sticks out to me at 50 to 1. Um, he was the favorite at one point, the betting favorite at one point on the weekend at the Rocket Mortgage, which um, I know, was that the last event before everything? Do I have that right? So before... In a uh, 3M, I guess it would have 3M, been. 3M, yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. I knew that was, Rocket Mortgage was Detroit. Yes. Woodland was, uh, for a moment, a betting favorite, you know, deep into the weekend at the 3M. I swear to you, he shot a minus six or something close to it on Thursday on his back nine at the Barracuda and still finished, like, very close to the top. I don't know what happened there, but if he just played, like, median golf, it's probably a T3 so I really do like what I'm seeing from Woodland right now. He is making um, making me make a decision in that range. Ricky Fowler, 55 to 1, continues to play well. Another guy who, I mean, he's been playing consistently well, and there were some peak moments at the 3M, but he got got uh, for about an hour on his Friday afternoon, which ended any chance of winning that tournament. Munoz, Kisner, a lot of live live names, in my opinion, uh, in this 50 to 1 range. I could see the majority of my card actually coming 50 and above here. Me too. The st starting starting as low on this board as I did, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It gives yeah, you a lot of opportunities sure. to fire these darts in here, right? I mean, even Charles Schwartzel. So he's he's all over the map. You want to shop this? Use the grid. Thirty three to one in some places, but Fanduel has him at fifty five to one. A couple other places as well. He's been gaining strokes consistently off the tee. He's been rolling the rock. The last time we saw Schwartzel again, it was that three M. Feels like a decade ago. He finished runner up there. I mean, he finished third at at, at Byron Nelson. He's had a couple. Of close calls in these kind of weaker field events. I really like the way that his advanced metrics set up, but yeah, Jeff, I mean, between him and Streelman and, you, and even Munoz, I, I could, I could live here. I could live in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. I mean, going farther, there's a few, a couple more names, you know, as we hit the sixties that I really do have an eye on, but 
you mentioned it. Like for me, great players get together. I love throwing a dart or two in the twenties, but when you don't like any time I choose not to, I'm really amazed. It's like, I make like three bets and it's like, <laughs> Whoa, I still have a lot of money to play with based right. on my weekly allocation. Cause I'm not, you know, having to make a one and a half times bet, uh, you know, farther or sorry, I should say shorter down the board. I went to bed last night, Rick, thinking I was so sharp, thinking I was going to wake up today and catch like an 80, a big number on Taylor Gooch. <laughs> the books, they said not so fast, Feinberg. We see how Taylor Gooch plays when we go to really easy courses. These are some of the easiest greens to hit on tour. We might have close to some of the most birdies we get weekly on tour. Um, as Brooks Kepka sometimes complains about, Rick, you know, we don't like these easy events. They're too easy. Anyone can win. And um, I don't know. I got a lot of signs pointing to me at Taylor Gooch, even if I have to swallow that 65 to one using that grid. Yeah, in 66, if you can get it at Bet MGM. But it, it is interesting because Gooch is um, much more highly respected amongst his peers than a lot of other guys. They think he's the real deal. He has a ton of game. And when you start listening uh, to what your, you know, when your peers start raving about you, it's, it's generally a pretty good sign. I'm not. I'm not a JT Poston guy. He's 80 to one at, at DraftKings. I'm not generally a, a Poston guy, but um, he coughed one up a couple of weeks ago on the back nine, an event that he should have won. And then he played well in his last start. And I'm thinking that the, either Poston uh, has found something with his irons, with its, his approach game, and I'm trying to be early here, and he's already one of the best putters on the PGA Tour, or Jeff, he hasn't found something and he goes back to being just regular JT Poston who relies on his putter. And at 80 to one, I didn't, I didn't risk much. That's, that's kind of the way I feel about trying to catch guys early. Yeah. And, um, you know, against a field like this, you know, you feel that much more, a lot, the guys you want to trust feel that much more live <laughs> knowing they won't have to say slay a dragon, a super elite on a Sunday. And there are a couple guys, both 80 to one. You mentioned it, Rick. It's it's the grid is 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 showing us Poston. He's coming in as high as 80, um, but with a floor of 50 to one. The 80 yeah. at DraftKings, 50 at Will Hill. That's a huge difference if you want a piece of JT. And much like JT Poston, Brendan Grace, 80 to one at the Borgata, 50 to one at Will Hill. Uh, he is a guy, if this tournament was a month ago. He would have been in that Brian Harmon betting range. Yep. So maybe there's an opportunity. You can make comps to Heritage, Sedgefield. Um, uh, he's won the Heritage before. I think there could be an opportunity at this at this uh, catching that big 80 to 1 on a guy like Brendan Grace this week. Yeah, the ability to see all these numbers in one spot uh, not only saves you a ton of time, but shows you the discrepancies, shows you the places that the books don't really line up or may, they might not know what to do with some of these guys. Um, okay, so if if I'm loading up on the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, which I think I am, I'm not sure how much action I'm getting into the triple digits, Jeff. Are you are you walking into you know 100 to 1 and, and deeper? Uh, I have made a bet at 100 to 1 okay. on DraftKings, Shez Revi. Again, yep. I'm not just here to talk about the grid. It's some weeks we might bring it up eight times, other weeks we might not bring it up. But a guy I want to bet is 100 to 1 at DraftKings. He's 60 elsewhere. Uh, I do believe there's a type of a course fit here uh, for Shez. He's been plodding along nicely. I'm not going to lie, I lost track of him at the Barracuda, but he has been attacking pins. For a while, his profile to me can fit along the past Wyndham Championship winners. We go to courses, and we might go to Minnesota and forever be confused about the type of player that course is going <laughs> to benefit, Rick. I feel like the Wyndham, you look at these past winners, it, it kind of helps you find that roadmap. Now, that probably has me ignoring, say, like a Bobby Mack because of it, and I might regret that, but... I don't know. It feels like there's a type of player that the Wyndham historically hands its trophy to. 
it's a very strong course history. It has been the same field since, or the same course since 2008. It is generally the exact same time on the schedule. It, it really does help out when you're trying to figure this out. Ches Revi has gained strokes on approach in six consecutive measured events. If you like the proximity buckets, which is a little bit of a flawed stat, but from 125 to 150, he's 11th. From 150 to 175, he's 10th. This is Let's a course. Go that you hit a lot of wedges from those areas at Revy 100 to one at DraftKings, by far uh, the best number because there's a lot shorter numbers out there. Uh, deeper than that, we're starting to fall off a cliff. In my opinion, Adam Shank, another golfer that, you know, in one place, he's 70 to one. If you look at FanDuel, he's 120 to one worth shopping. He finished fourth last week, his second, fourth place finish in his last four starts. I think that's where I draw the line, Jeff. Uh, Adam Shank, 120 to one is probably where I draw the line, but is there anybody else down here that we should be discussing? Um, I like Shank. He's just been so consistent. Maybe you want to supplement it with a placing. Yeah, like Shank and Libiota, I feel could be really popular because they've really, if you've been backing them, you end the week continuing feeling good about them, feeling like that moment could be on the precipice for them. There's a guy I'm going farther down the board for. I'm trying to find the number. Maybe it's just <laughs> so gotten, so far down the board that we can't find it. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's actually gotten bigger, Rick. So maybe you can help me. I I could sure. just be getting cocky and trying to call something. I like what I've seen from the guy. He was hot early in the year, and I think we're seeing the signs of form again. Tricky little player to, to figure out, but uh, Sam Ryder mm. uh, is popping for me this week. Last I saw oh, it was keep, around. Keep scrolling. One. Keep scrolling. So FanDuel has him at 250 to 1, Jeff. Now, of course, some other places, BetMGM 150, DraftKings 180, but if you have a FanDuel access, 250. 50 yeah. to one. I don't know. He's just been, he's, he's popping on some of the things I'm looking at and I've been watching him. I've been rostering him a lot lately. He's been making me happy, making good on those prices and efforts. And I don't know if there's a, like we sort of said off the top, there's like a, a guy you'd probably never want to bet in a regular field event, but you get into this event and there's some scrub that you got a feeling for. Sometimes these events cost me more money because it's like I have a, a stronger belief that the scrub can take it home because he won't have to, as I've said a few times, like stare down an elite on Sunday and ruin a great week. It's it's going to be fun. It's There's going to be a lot of implications for the next couple of weeks for the FedEx Cup playoffs. There's going to be an opportunity for a lot of these guys to make a lot of hay, make a name for themselves, and I think plenty of value 50 and deeper on the board. So, Jeff, uh, I'm looking forward to it, man. It's going to be great. Yeah, yeah certainly. And, and, you know, we get this one. And I got to say, I, I believe the next two weeks of golf after the Wyndham are probably, you know, mm. we get so excited for the majors, Rick. Probably the two strongest fields when you consider everything that we get the all year. Arguably the two hardest events to win. Yeah. As, as silly as that might sound. So, yeah, I don't know. Golf is coming to an end a bit here, but I'm getting uh, the thoughts of these early FedEx Cup events and the Ryder Cup are firing me up. There you go. That's Jeff Feinberg. I'm Rick Game, and this has been your odds checker betting preview for this week's Wyndham Championship. Best of luck, and we'll see you soon.